Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Just give it a minute here while everybody uh, comes in from the waiting room. Let's actually turn the waiting room off so everyone can just hop in and join. I know sometimes it takes a second for audio to connect, so just give this a second here. Is that Nathan Lujan? Did I specifically said, I told the bouncer. <laughs> <laughs> Those digital bouncers, you know, it's <laughs> all right. I think we got everyone. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, on behalf of Drexel University and the Academy of Natural Sciences, uh, uh, welcome to ANS Travelogs, connecting dam building in Brazil to climate change. My name is Mike Kuzmarczyk. I'm the adult programs developer at the Academy of Natural Sciences and just be helping out a little bit to moderate the program, keep our featured speaker in check the best I can, but uh, I'm really excited to introduce our collection manager of fishes at the Academy, Dr. Mark Sabay. And I am just gonna leave it at that and let Mark uh, take us away to Brazil. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Um, and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. I hope everybody is uh, reasonably safe and sound. And um, if you're joining this talk, hoping to see a lot of graphs, graphs and charts about rising temperatures and warming seas, you're going to be disappointed because I only have a couple slides about climate change. Um, and so let's begin. Okay. Uh, let's figure this out. Oh. All right. So, oh, going to the title of my talk. So this is an eschatological look at um, at Rio Jingo. Rio Jingo's Big Ben, Vulture Grange. All right, and for those of you who might, might not be familiar with the term eschatological, that is a branch of theology that is concerned with the end of the world or of humankind. And human beings have um, wonderful imaginations, and we've thought of many different ways for the world to end. Back in biblical times, the end of the world would uh, come to us um, on horseback the four riders of the apocalypse, war, famine, pestilence, and death. Uh, and then as we move into the late 1800s, the end of the world was uh, invasion from outer space. More recently, nuclear war, uh, depletion of the global oil supply, followed by a collapse of society. Perhaps the um, acquisition of self-awareness by artificial intelligence unbridled consumerism, a rogue planet, or uh, a disruption of the space-time continuum. All of these things have been postulated as uh, potential uh, end-of-the-world scenarios. And of course, climate change as well. So uh, moving on from that, I'm going to argue that dams, especially in the neotropics, could also be the, uh, the signal of the end of the world. Well, maybe not that bad, but they're pretty bad. And so, so this bit dam here on the Rio Jingu, this is the Pimental Dam, and this is uh, Belo Monte. All right, so I'm gonna take you to South America. This is the South American continent. And we're gonna zoom in on this area here in Northern South America in the Amazon basin. And uh, in the middle of there is the Rio Jingu. And the headwaters of the Rio Jingu arise on the Guapore, or the Brazilian Shield, um, and flow north into the Amazon River. And much of the, the watershed of the Rio Xingu is occupied by uh, indigenous peoples. These are um, lands set aside for, uh, for their use. This area has also been recently bisected by road building. So this is BR-163, which connects to the Trans-Amazonian Highway. Uh, for a long time, this area was, was unsettled and un, unreach, unreachable by, uh, by road. And this, these, this road system really opened up this area for development. Uh, the Trans-Amazonian -Am Highway uh, links up Manaus on the Amazon River with Belém near the mouth of the Amazon. And so this, this bisects this area. And along with the road building has come development. Uh, what we see here are uh, increased logging, uh, cattle ranching, 
and soya production, especially in the southern part of this basin, and a little bit of tourism. Um, that Talisma Hotel was supposed to be a tourist hotel. Um, so to fuel all of this development, you need power, you need electricity. And that's, this has been one of the impetuses, impetus I for dam building in the watershed, especially in the headwaters and then more recently in the lower Shingu. All right, so the next part here, we're gonna zoom in on this part right here called Volchagrangi or Big Bend. And in this part, this, this tremendous river, this, this huge river undergoes three 90 degree turns in a relatively short span of only of about 100 to 150 kilometers. Uh, it takes these three turns as it leaves the Brazilian shield. So that's the edge of the shield right there. And this shield is, is, is rock, it's granitoid rock. Most of the soil has been washed from the surface and it's, uh, the, the water's just flowing over the bare rock. And then after the river leaves the shield, it enters the, uh, so that's basement rock. And then after that, it enters the sediment basin of the Amazon River. And that's where the, you see the Shingu starts to open up into a, into a mouth bay. And the Trans-Amazonian Highway follows the edge of that shield. All right. And then it's this part, Volcho Grande, that is, is really fantastic. There's no other place like it on Earth in terms of big rivers. Uh, the river itself is broken up into these anastomosing uh, braids in this part here. And then this last part is, is truly amazing. It's a, like a lithoaquatic labyrinth. Basically, the, the river although it's large and powerful, it can't, the, the rock is too hard for it to cut, to cut a singular channel uh, through that rock. And so what the river does is it just busts up into a bunch of smaller channels and follows these fractures in the basement rocks. And that's why you see the river kind of zigzagging back and forth. It's following these large fractures in the basement rock. Um, and this, this picture here is during the low water season. So during the low water season, um, the river is really confined to these fractures. In the high water season, much of this uh, in natural conditions is, is flooded. And here's an idea, here's some, I'm gonna show you next some pictures of, of this beautiful river. So um, this is a, a waterfall complex called Jericoa. And in the bottom right corner, you can see some people there. So you can get a, a, a little bit of a, the size of the scale we're looking at here, just, just a huge water, waterfall complex. And this is in the low water season. So in about, oh, August, September. Uh, here's another waterfalls uh, near the end of that Vulture Grange turn. Um, again, very powerful. Uh, a drone view of yet more waterfalls. I mean, this, this, this river has an uncounted number of waterfalls and cataracts in it. Um, again, this is all during the low water season where much of the basement rock is exposed and the water is flowing over these in these cataracts. Um, and the water itself is, is beautiful, it's clear, naturally it's clear. Um, and this is an area called uh, Porcao. I'm probably not pronouncing that well, my Portuguese is pretty lousy. Uh, but during the low water season, you can just see how much, um, how much of the rock is exposed. This is the basement rock. And again, the river's following these fractures in the channels, large and small fractures. And in the high water season, this would be completely flooded. This would be completely inundated. Um, so um, it's, it's pretty tremendous, the, the, uh, the range from low water to high water, how much difference you see in this river. Um, and, and these are drone shots taken by one of my colleagues, um, Oliver. Uh, and then one of the things that I like to call this is a river of rivers. So you have this big river system, but you also have small tributaries and the braids themselves are, can be small and mimic um, small rivers, small creeks. So in the top left corner there, that's not a small creek. That's one of the. That's a small braid within this larger river system, and so uh, during the wa low water season, as this river gets dissected into these different microhabitats, 
that really helps uh, afford different, uh, um, allows there to be a lot of aquatic biodiversity in this area because you have so many of these different microhabitats. All right, so we'll start off with a little lesson here in uh, the history of Brazilian law. And we'll start out here with the, um, the establishment of the national environmental policy in the 1980s in Brazil. And what's interesting about this is that it legally defined the environment as a set of physical, chemical, and biological conditions, laws, influences, and interactions that facilitates, shelters, and governs life in its, all its forms. So I thought that was pretty neat. I mean, I, obviously a lawyer didn't write that. Well, maybe a lawyer wrote it, but I think they had help from a biologist because uh, that captures, uh, that's the legal definition of the environment in Brazil. And this law also enabled the, the federal public ministry to institute criminal and civil liability proceedings for damages to the environment. All right, so this is pretty forward thinking, I think. Um, it, it recognizes the importance of the environment, and if you destroy it, you, you're going to be held accountable according to this law. Um, next, we have here another law which that empowers the, uh, the federal ministry um, to litigate in defense of collective and, uh, used and, and diffuse interests, including those concerning damages to the environment. So this is class action lawsuits. Uh, and this was held up at, as a model for other civil law countries when it was, when it was act, enacted. Um, again, the, this is the uh, power by the, the federal public ministry. And then in 1988, uh, there's the new Brazilian, Brazilian constitution. And this was pretty forward thinking as well. So this is the first constitution to include the environment as a separate concept, uh, specifically an autonomous juridical, <laughs> juridical entity. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure exactly what that means. But anyways, what's most interesting about this law to me is that all Brazilians have a right to an ecologically balanced environment that is held in the common good. Um, and it's essential, essential to, the, to the, a healthy quality of life. And both the government and the community have the duty to defend and preserve this environment uh, for future generations. Um, this, law, this constitution also includes an article that says, Congress must consult with indigenous peoples before authorizing use of water resources, including hydropower, on their lands. And this constitution once again expanded the power of the, uh, of the uh, MPF to enforce these vir environmental laws. All right, so these, these are all things that should be working for the environment. This is in the constitution, uh, the Brazilian constitution. So that alone, these laws alone should have protected this stretch of the Shingu River from the kind of insults that is that that uh, it, it should have protected it basically, uh, but unfortunately, this stretch of the Shingu River, according to the engineers, this place was made for a dam, and so begins uh, the construction of Belamanchi. The, the first survey of this area by the engineers was in the 1970s, and they looked at this area for, for hydropower development. And what the engineers suggested in 1987 was that this river be impounded by up to seven separate dams. All right, so what the engineers realized is that this river has a strong seasonal component. In the low water season, it, the, water, the river is very low. In the high water season, it's very high. So with this strong seasonal component for a dam, a hydroelectric dam to operate efficiently, it needs a constant supply of water at about the same levels. And in, or, in order to uh, compensate for the seasonality, they proposed seven different dams on this river, basically to control it um, so the engineers can control it month to month, year to year. Um, but if you remember from my earlier slide, a lot of this land that was going to be flooded by these dams is occupied by, by indigenous peoples. And they didn't like this idea at all. 
so in 1988, um, Kayapo Chiefs and American ethnobiologist, ethnobiologist Daryl Posey um, began the first protests against the constructions of these dams. Uh, and the World Bank at the time was about to loan a big sum of money for, for the initiation of this project, and they withheld that loan because of these protests. And it's kind of interesting, at the time, so this is 1988, they were, uh, Daryl Posey and the Kayapo chiefs were brought up on criminal charges because under Brazilian law, non-Brazilians cannot interfere with Brazil's internal affairs. So in order to bring this lawsuit, they classified the indigenous people as non-Brazilians. Um, that lawsuit was eventually dropped, but um, yeah, kind of strange. So this first uh, um, defense of the Shingu River, it was, uh, it was a pretty uh, a, a well-covered protest. Um, Daryl Posey's there on the right, and then the guy in the middle you might recognize, that's Sting. Uh, the first of many um, celebrities to join uh, this movement against Bellamanchi. And during this, um, during this event, Electro Norte, which is one of the builders of the dam, they limited the, the, the hydroelectric project to just two dams. Okay, they said, all right, all right, we won't build seven dams in, on the Shingu, we'll only build two. But they didn't promise to build, not to build the other four. They just said, We're, we'll build two, and, but they didn't promise not to build the other four. Um, and this event had this, there, there was this famous event where, where uh, Tuira, a Kayapo woman, uh, she laid her machete against the face of the chief engineer of the, uh, of the dam project as a, as a protest, basically saying, this is, this is our land, this is our water, and you, know, you have no right to do this. Um, that engineer, and as partially in a, as a result of this, Electro Norte abandoned this Kayopo name for the dam. They were going to name it Carraro, ah, Carraro uh, which was a Kayopo word for war cry. So the engineers really thought it was a good idea to, even though they were heavily impacting these indigenous culture, they were going to steal one of their words to name their dam, which just seems absurd. And uh, a few years ago, Tuir was um, honored with the description of a new species of spatula or caria uh, by a group of uh, Brazilian ichthyologists. Uh, they named this beautiful species of Laura Creed uh, after her. Um, and then in more recent years, there's, there's other movements, the uh, MAB, the Movement of Peoples Affected by Dams, uh, the Mu Movement of Shingu Forever Alive. And again, these, so these protests that began in the, in the late 1980s were sustained all the way up to the completion of the dam. People were constantly protesting uh, the construction of this dam at almost every turn. And they were joined by a number of celebrities uh, after Sting. This is Sigourney Weaver. She produced a YouTube video on the dam. Um, and director James Cameron, uh, around the time he was filming Avatar, joins the movement. So again, you can kind of see the where he might have gotten some ideas for that movie uh, from this struggle. Um, and around this time, too, this is around the time of the Occupy movements that were happen happening globally. And so the, the construction project at this stage, they're creating a coffer dam of, of earth to, to slow the, the Shingu main stem. And you can see the, the earth there kind of rolled out to um, uh, in that dam-like line to, uh, to, to stop the, the main channel of the river. And this was occupied by, uh, by indigenous people and local protesters who spelled out Pare Bellamonte, Stop Bellamonte. And they even dug a, dug a trench uh, through, the, uh, through the earthen dike to let the Shingu run, you know, a, a few meters there. Um, you know, it was a win for, 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 for that moment. But in response to this, um, the dam builders, uh, Electro Norte, basically went to the uh, judges and said, you got you to put an end to this. And so the judges ruled against the protesters and they said, um, you can't interfere with the construction of this dam. And if you do, you'll be fined uh, 50,000 hails a day. And so that basically shut down these protests. And the, 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 
the, the response there from the government was basically, Bellamanchi must be built. Um, also, around this time, it's, it was pretty dangerous to be an environmentalist in Brazil. Um, in just in 2015 alone, 50 environmentalists were killed in Brazil, murdered. Uh, according to the map there, you can see Brazil is the most dangerous place in the world to be an environmentalist. Um, some high profile uh, murders, uh, Dorothy May Stang, she was a, a, a US citizen who had worked in Brazil. She was a, a Catholic nun who fought on behalf of the poor and, and environmentalists. And she was savagely gunned down by, uh, by logging, uh, people who controlled logging, the logging industry. Um, she was, just a few months ago, she was honored uh, with the description of a new species of screech owl. Um, the lead author on that was Sidney Dantas, and co-authors were uh, Therese Kadenech and Jason Wexstein here at the Academy. So, uh, yes. Another person, uh, this fellow here, he was um, working for the municipality of Altamira, which is the city where um, a lot of the construction uh, that supported the construction of the, the dam project. And on behalf of the, 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 the uh, state ministry, um, his team was responsible for the arrests of, or, or helped out in the arrest of a huge logging, illegal logging operation. Uh, and the head of that logging operation was fined $37 million, the largest fine ever in Brazil. He also, his team also uncovered 16.2 tons of dead fish that were secretly buried near the dam. Uh, they were probably suffered from uh, the, the turbines. As the turbines in the dam were being tested, these fish were probably killed. And the dam operator was fined $11 million. Um, so after these two wins, uh, basically he was, he was gunned down in an ex execution style killing. Um, so a, a lot of these people, again, that were protesting the, some of the most successful protests, the leaders of these protests, they, they just get, they get, they were gunned down um, for, for, for their actions. Uh, and then this person here, who sat on the Brazilian uh, Supreme Court, uh, Teori. So at this time, there was a huge uh, government, Brazilian government-wide uh, investigation of corruption at the highest levels. And one of the, it was called Lavo Jato, which basically means car wash. Not basically, it does that. Lavo Jato is a car wash. Um, and so this, they were investigating uh, Petrobras, the, the quasi-state-owned oil company, and um, also executives at Odebrecht, which is Latin America's largest construction company. And his testimony, he was going to testify in this case, and it was dubbed uh, uh, Declaro, I gotta work on my Portuguese, do fim do mundo. Uh, due to the potential, the anticipated impact on the Brazilian government. So shortly before he was about to testify, um, he was in a small plane that plunged in the sea off the coast of Rio de Janeiro in bad weather. And so that, that didn't happen. Um, this person, this activist, is still, is still alive. Um, Philip Fernside, he's an anti, he's a scientist and anti-dam crusader who's been fighting dams for, for almost his whole career. And, uh, and um, has published many papers basically demonstrating the, the ill effects of, of dam building, especially in the tropics. Um, and here's my, here's my climate change slide basically. So, um, Dam building in the tropics, what happens is that you end up flooding um, areas that are rich in vegetation, all right? And when that vegeta vegetation starts to decay, uh, especially, and it will decay year round because it's warm tropical floodwaters, it'll release CO2 and methane. And uh, it's been estimated that uh, Reservoirs will release up to 3.3 million, have released up to 3.3 million U.S. tons of methane per year. 
Um, and methane is much worse than carbon dioxide when it comes in terms of being a, a, a climate change, get, a, a warming impact. Um, over a 100-year period, methane is 34 more times powerful at warming the planet. Um, also, the, the, these reservoirs uh, emit four, four times, as much as four times more uh, methane and carbon dioxide than a comparable fossil fuel plant generating the same amount of electricity. And then it's one estimate has 4% of, uh, of uh, global warming attributable to reservoirs. Um, and I got to see this firsthand. So this is, Altamira is on your left there. That's the city looking part. And then in front of that is this huge island right in the middle of the channel. And the engineers basically, um, when they started flooding the, the Shingu channel, they anticipated flooding this island completely. So this island is, um, you know, it's, it occurs there naturally, and they anticipated the reservoir would completely inundate this island. So part of the regulations that they had to follow is that they had to remove all of the vegetation from this island before it was flooded so it wouldn't decay. And so that's what we got to see here. Basically, um, you know, they, they, they moved large uh, caterpillars and that onto there and dug these trenches, all right? They cut down the trees and then they bulldozed uh, all that vegetation into these trenches and then they lit it on fire, which of course released CO2. But the idea here is that the amount of CO2 that they'd be releasing with this massive burn would be less than the amount of methane released if they just inundated it and let it decay uh, underwater. Um, and then as it turned out, the engineers were, were kind of wrong. This island didn't get flooded. So, um, yeah. Anyways, and scientists from the very beginning too, uh, in, especially in Brazil, have been against this dam project from the beginning. So, so from the late 80s, uh, Brazilian scientists have been saying this is going to have a terrible impact on the environment. Um, this is this is a very important natural stretch of river, um, and it, it's going to have severe consequences on that. And so the the, the scientists were unanimous. Uni, uh, uni, they were there were no disagreements among the scientists on whether or not this dam should be built, uh, and. Some of us wrote some, some papers on this too. Um, and, and Fernside as well. Once again, he was uh, very active in, in leading this charge among the scientists. Um, and as you get this, this map here is to show the, pro the, blacks, the back black uh, bars there show where dams have been built already in the Brazilian Amazon. And, and a lot of these dams occur on clear water rivers. And there's a reason for that. Um, clear water rivers carry, have low sediment loads. And so if you build a dam, your reservoir is gonna, the lifespan of your res reservoir is gonna be a lot longer. Uh, reservoirs naturally over time, they stop those sediments, the sediments fall out, and the reservoir gets filled with the sediment. But if, you're, if you have a dam on a, on a clear water river, um, you have much more time before the before that reservoir gets filled with sediment. Um, and as you can see here, that that dam to the farthest to the east, that's the Rio Tocantins. That's dubbed the dammed river because um, there's just so many dams on it that it, 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 there are rarely places in it where it still flows naturally. Um, and then the, the the red bars are where dams are proposed. Uh, for for other parts of uh, other parts of these rivers, uh, so there's Bellamachi. So so in this case we have we have a case where you have strict laws protecting environment and indigenous cultures. Uh, you have a powerful federal public ministry for enforcing those laws. You have sustained public protest and opposition, and then you. <laughs> unanimous scientific opposition to this dam. It should have never been built, okay? You had all of these things going for it. 
how did this thing, how did this tragedy, how did this abomination happen? And my quick answer to that is 40 billion reals or 9.5 billion US. Um, that's not based on today's conversion, so I don't know what, what, it, what it would be today. It's the money. This project was huge. It's, it's the fourth largest dam complex in the world. It attracted all of this money. And when you have this much money involved in a construction project, it steamrolls everything else. There's lots of people being paid. There's, there's, it just sucks in corruption and, and people want a piece of this money. So they, at every turn, um, they ensure that they get it. And a lot of people made a ton of money off of this project. Um, did it benefit the people at all? Uh, recently, um, Walter Coronado and Tunis said, this is one of the least efficient hydropower projects in the history of Brazil. So during the low water season, this dam is only about 10% of what its intended capacity is. It's just, it's a boondoggle. It's, it was a, and, and the engineers knew this from the beginning. Why did they know this from the beginning? Because in the 1970s, they said this river is so highly seasonal. It's so variable. If you want to make an efficient dam, you don't, you don't make one. You make seven. So you can control the water flow from month to month and make sure that the, the turbines have enough water to operate at peak efficiency. So the engineers knew that this was going to be a, a complete failure with just one dam. Uh, they knew that from the beginning. But there, again, there's just there was a ton of money involved here. And so it's kind of the what the 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 camel head in the tent or something like that. There's a euphemism a metaphor. Um, Basically, I think they, they were thinking, if we could build this one dam and then we can show how inefficient it is, that'll give us leverage to build these additional dams. And that, that will save everything, except for the environment. All right, so moving on to our project, um, basically, well, here's an eschatological timeline. Construction began in 2011, and um, the, the power generation was in, um, began in 2016. And this is called run of the river hydroelectricity. And this is supposed to be cleaner or safer than uh, other methods of hydroelectricity. Basically what you do, um, this is not the Shingu, this is a tributary in the, in the headwaters. This is the real Kura. And that blue line traces the, uh, the course of the river. And there's two beautiful waterfalls uh, on, this, on this river that you see there. So in run of the river hydroelectricity, you basically you build an upstream dam, a, a diversion dam, and that diverts the water into pipes that are, that are kind of parallel the river. And then at the bottom, the water feeds back into the, uh, into the, into the natural river, and that's usually where the hydro, hydroelectric plant, the main point of generation is. Um, so as you see in this, what they do is they kind of short circuit these waterfalls. And now how much water is in the natural channel is completely dependent on the engineers. If they want that, that red line to have more water, they just divert more water from the main channel and these waterfalls could go dry. I'm not, uh, this was, these pictures were taken back in 2007 when this was being constructed. But, but the natural course of that river between the upstream and downstream dams, that's completely de determined by the engineers. So, and here's what this looks like on a much larger scale for the Rio Shingu. So you have the, the long red line is the diversion dam that creates the in-stream reservoir. And then there's canals that create this off-stream reservoir, which then feeds the main power station before the water is returned to the main channel. And what this creates, it creates two systems now. You have this flooded habitat. These used to be cataracts, waterfalls, fast flowing water. It's now completely flooded. And then downstream of the diversion dam, you have this dewatered habitat. So how much water gets between those two red lines, again, is determined by the engineers. And at times when, um, if they don't have enough water, 
there's, there's, the, there's the risk that they could divert all of it to the offstream reservoir, and this downstream part won't get barely any at, at all. And remember, this downstream part is full of cataracts and waterfalls and fast-flowing fast water. And the, the aquatic life that live there is adapted for that. So they need water. And not just any water. They need flowing water and lots of it. All right. So there's laws Mark, like in the United States. Yeah. I just want to, uh, we had a question real quick about who paid for that $9.5 billion dam. I think it was mostly the National Bank of Brazil, wasn't it? The BNDES or... It was is funded by a large. A lot of it was funded by a large Brazilian bank, and the I think the the World Bank kicked in some money early on. I, I, there's a few Brazilians on. If they want to, <laughs> if they could provide that inf information in the chat, that would be helpful. <laughs> Good outsourcing, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> um, Public Brazilian money we have uh, in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, the Brazilians paid for it. I mean, in many different ways. So um, part of these construction projects, they, they do have an uh, environmental assessment uh, associated with them. Um, and this fellow right here, this handsome young man right here, this is Leandro Sosa. He's an ichthyologist based in Altamira. And he was one of my partners in, in, in this project. Um, and he was uh, part of the environmental assessment team uh, associated with the, with the construction. And, and he was supervising the, the monitoring and the taxonomic survey. And that's where kind of I was able to plug in uh, with, uh, with our project was, was into his taxonomic survey. Um, and then there's also a rescue squad. So when you dry down these portions of river, they do try to save the fish. Um, yeah, I won't get into that. But part of the part of the, some of those fish, um, the the dam builders funded a breeding facility uh, for Leandro, and some of the fish that impacted by the dam, they're trying to breed them in this in this uh, breeding facility. And then my other partner is uh, Dr. Uh, Lucia Happy Daniel, and she's based in Manaus, and she might I, I'm not sure if she, she I think she registered, but I don't know if she's if she made it tonight. But anyway, she she also uh, collaborated with Landra and I on this, on this big project, uh, and she's based in Manaus. And, I, and thanks to, and also she contributed a lot of uh, students to, to our project, so we, we took a lot of students out in the field with us. That's her lab. Um, all right, taking you to Altamira. This is the port of Altamira. This is before things got flooded. Um, and this dam, this project was sold to the people of Altamira as a sa it was their savior. It was going to bring shaking hands and lots of money, economic development, and all these great things to this otherwise, you know, modest community on the banks of the Rio Xingu. Um, it had an eye store. Uh, who doesn't like Apple computers? So they, I don't know if this was an official eye store, but uh, one did open up as they started building the dam. Um, lots of the sidewalks became. Uh, handicap accessible, except they didn't build them. They didn't use a concrete that could withstand the rainy season. Um, and again, this was, this is, so you started to see this mix of cultures with this really, this modernization occurred almost overnight uh, in a place where, yeah, so there, 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 there was, there was tensions that, that, um, that arose from this. And this slide kind of, kind of shows that you have, kind of the traditional fishermen's houses there right along the river. They're built on these tall stilts because that water fluctuates that distance uh, from uh, over the course of a year. So this is the low water season and the high water season, that river would be right up to uh, those porches. And then right above this local community of fishermen are these huge mansions um, Probably it's probably an engineer's mansion. Somebody who's working on the the Bellomachi project probably probably built that, um, or a politician. Uh, this is a store where you can buy some kayaks and some fishing gear, 
or um, a mercury motor. So um, they thought once they get this reservoir built, there's going to be a lot of kayaking, I guess. Uh, all right, this is a transitional side. We're going on the river. One of the first things you notice about the river when you get out there, it's rocks and sand. Lots of big rocks and tons of sand. And that's kind of what it looks like there. And again, these, you have these powerful waterfalls that are carrying that sand downstream, all right? So you can imagine um, this sand scours the rocks as it carries there, but there is life that, that also clings to these rocks. And this is a, a river weed called Potostomaceae. There's several different species of this. It occurs circumtropically. And um, that sand in the water scours and polishes these rocks over time. So here you see what look like oily rocks. They're not oily, it's just, it's been polished by the sand and water over a long time. Uh, and that will also carve out these uh, holes, these really cool holes in the granite that become uh, habitat for the fishes that live there. Uh, here we are, so, so for a lot of our collecting, we, we, um, we look to ornamental fishermen to help us. So these are locals who make a living collecting mostly lower Korean catfishes, but other things as well for the, the global, uh, for the global aquarium fish hobby. And here we see, um, so that, that's a flashlight. They, they dive down pretty deep, up to like 30 meters. And that flashlight's got a bulb and the, it's supplied by a cord that goes around the uh, that tube there that goes to the compressor. And when the compressor it was a really old compressor and it was constantly just petering out. So when the compressor peters out, the flashlight goes off and then the diver knows that he's not getting any fresh air and he's only got so much time to get back to the surface. So that was, that was what they used. Um, this is what they used to hold the lower Koreas when they're down there. This is a um, repurposed uh, liter bottle, probably Coke. And then um, here's what an ornamental fisherman look like. This is Danny, and he's like the he's like the alpha fisherman of the ornamental fishermen. He knew um, he's forgotten more about lower creeds than I'll ever know. And basically, they this is a shallow dive, so they're diving around with the uh, looking for lower creeds. Um, and that stick there that he's holding, I brought one home, but I don't have it right now. Basically, they use that stick, uh, that sharp stick that they make, to pry these catfishes out from these crevices in the rocks. So there he's holding the stick, and there he's holding a uh, one of the prizes up there. So this fish, its entire distribution is in the impact zone of Bellomanchi. Half of its habitat is flooded, so it probably doesn't occur there anymore. And the other half of it is dewatered. Whether it occurs there or not still is... is, is questionable. There's probably more of these fish. Well, I don't, I don't know exactly because I, I haven't counted them, but there are a lot of these fishes in aquaria around the world. So it's not in danger of going extinct globally. It may go extinct in the wild, but a lot of people keep these um, in their homes and they breed them. So, you know, what that we can get in, uh, into a discussion of what counts as extinction. If it no longer occurs in the wild and its habitat is completely gone, does it count if it's occurring in somebody's fish tank? Um, and then while we're out there, we try to take tissue samples uh, for genetic analyses and for isotopic studies. So here, um, and those go into three, into these little two, miller, two millimeter Nalgene uh, jars. Uh, we also tried to take photographs of the fishes live. So here we are. That's Leandro. He's a much better photographer than me. Um, and then to produce things like field guides and that, so, so to help other people identify them. That's another transition slide to Potostomaceae. Oh, to the fishes. Okay, so yeah, so the Potostomaceae, that provides great habitat for a lot of these fishes that you see, uh, some of which you only see in the Shingu and only in the rapids. Not this one. This is uh, the, the red-eyed piranha. So this is pretty ubiquitous throughout South America. Um, I just put that in there because it's a piranha and people like to see piranha. They do really have sharp, shark-like teeth. Um, 
but they're not really a danger to you unless uh, unless you like in this case um this is when most people get ichthyologists get bit by a piranha when they're like fiddling with the mouth when it's not completely dead uh this is the eagle beak paku asuptus um its mouth is uh it's almost a ventral mouth, which is really interesting for this group of fishes. And its teeth are, are like combs, and they comb through that potus de maceae to get uh, invertebrates. And this only occurs in these rapids in the Shingu. Uh, this is a new species that was discovered during our project, Tomides. It's a large, uh, another large fish that inhabits the rapids. And, if, and its teeth are much different than, than the previous two. These are molarine teeth, so it's a it's a uh, grinding uh, vegetable matter. And you might notice there that this, this hole in the side of it, that's not natural. So this fish was caught by one of the ornamental fishermen, and this is what he used to catch it. So this is, uh, this is like a makeshift um, spear gun with, uh, you can see there's a piece of rebar there on, on, uh, that he's using, and there's a swivel at the end of it. Um, so I thought this was really cool. This is something he made, and, I'll tell you what, in a post-apocalyptic setting, ornamental fishermen are going to do all right. Um, the ichthyologists, like me, will we'll probably be the first ones eaten. We'll be the first ones gone. We're a little delicate. But ornamental fishermen, they're going to be around. So you might want to make, make some friends among that group <laughs> if, if you see the horsemen coming. Um, all right, lower Koreans, mega diverse in this part of the river. Um, and again, these are real popular in the, in the aquarium trade. Um, and a lot of these have been bred uh, outside of the river by, by aquarists around the world. And they, lower creeds have this sucker-like mouth uh, with these tiny little teeth that they use to scrape the rocks for, uh, for microorganisms and algae. Here's that hip and cistrus zebra again, one of the most popular ones. Uh, these sell for a few hundred dollars. Um, in, in a breeding pair might sell for a few hundred dollars in, in Germany. Um, some questions we have. So some, some of these lower Koreans have tiny little white dots and some have bigger white dots. Are these two separate species or not? We don't know. They could be. And those are some of the things that we study. Um, this particular fish, this is a hip ancestress with these vermiculate lines. These occur at the downstream end of its range, and then if you go further upstream, those lines become spots. And then between these two extremes, you have kind of an intermediate condition. So what's going on here? Are, they, are these local adaptations? Or are these different species that have come into contact and are now hybridizing? These are the kind of questions we ask and try to answer with, uh, with the genetic data. Um, and then just recently, um, Brazilian co-authors uh, uh, collaborated on the description of four new species of Hopley and Cistrus that occur in both the Shingu and the Tapajos. And, and this one, the, the one on the right there, in the bottom right, they gave a great name. They called it Hopley and Cistrus wolverine. All right? And if you look on its cheek, it's got these three like dagger-like spines. And, and so that it's named after the character Wolverine. And these hurt, too. So if you, if you tickle its nose, uh, it, will, it will jab you. It, it will get you. Thankfully, it's not toxic. But, um, but yeah, it uses these as defense and also to, if it's deep in a crevice and it averts those, it's kind of hard to pull it out. It, it serves as an anchor, too. Um, that's another transitional slide. Those are incestuous with the fleshy tentacles in the form of a star. Um, all right, so I'm getting near the end here. Let's see what my time is. Oh, geez. All right. So, again, we're moving here. These waterfalls that I told you about, they occur in the, in the part of the river that's being dewatered. And in, in a natural sense, um, we thought that these might be barriers to the movement of fishes. And that's because when we looked at the distribution of the different fishes, we see some species like this cicla at the bottom only occurred upstream of the lowest waterfall, whereas another species occurred downstream. And, and then a third species occurs only in tributaries. 
Again, for this catfish, for this dorated catfish, there's one species that occurs upstream of the, of the last waterfall and another one that occurs downstream. So that led us to think that perhaps this is a barrier to fish migration. Some fishes occur both upstream and downstream of, this, of, of these waterfalls, uh, these, like these big migratory catfishes. They, the waterfalls are not a problem for them. And they're probably moving during the, the high water season when, the, when they can navigate those strong waterfalls. Um, and then there's uh, stingrays. So this one, Potamotrigon orbignii, it's ubiquitous, cosmopolitan, occurs all along the river. But then other species only occur downstream of the falls, and then other species only occur upstream. And then there's some species pair that occur up and downstream, again, with that break at the waterfalls. Um, so we postulated that perhaps these are natural barriers. Now you've introduced an artificial barrier in this dam, in this in-stream dam. And one of the ways the engineers tried to alleviate this artificial barrier is with a fish ladder. But studies have shown that fish ladders in tropical streams don't work all that well. Um, here's an example of a fish ladder. It's basically a straight channel that takes the fish from below the dam to, to the reservoir above. And the reasons why these don't work too well is because um, they become dominated by just a few species. Um, most fish use it to move upstream, but they don't use it so much to move downstream. Um, and then predators learn that these canals full of migrating fish are basically just buffets. And so things like dolphins and birds and turtles will hang out either at the mouth of these fish ladders and just eat as, as the fish come moving through it. And some will actually take up residence in the canal and just feed as the fishes migrate through. So they're, they don't work too well. Um, I'll kind of breeze through this. This is just kind of showing you the, this system is, is not monolithic. It has a lot of different water chemistries that different groups of fishes have adapted for. So in this case, uh, clear waters, uh, tannin-stained waters, you have a certain composition group of fishes. Um, this is to give you an idea of high versus low water. So on the left is the low water, and there's rapids and rocks. And then during the high water season, that's completely flooded. You don't see any of that. And with this large change in water levels is a change in the water chemistry. Um, again, a high, there's a high seasonality to this river system. Um, that little red dot is where I'm going to show you next. So here on the left, this is the low water season. This is an island. It's completely dry. In the high water season, it's completely flooded. And this pro provides new habitats for uh, fishes to um, uh, to use for spawning and as nurseries. Uh, again, low water, high water. So there's a big, there's a big seasonal fluctuation in this river. Um, and this little lake here, so in the low water season, it's isolated, all right? It's isolated and fish might, um, you might have one fish community in there in a habitat like this with water chemistry like this. And this is uh, Alani. She was part of our team, and she's uh, fishing for electric eels. So electric eels love this kind of habitat. And the way you get them is they have to breathe air. So when they surface for air, you try and gaff them with this pole. And she's really good at it. Um, and one of the specimens, some of the specimens that we caught on here uh, actually went towards a de description of a new species, uh, Electrophorus varii. And then during the high water season, that lake there becomes connected to the main channel. The water chemistry changes, and the predators can move in from the main channel. So large fishes like uh, hydrolycus and piranhas can move into that lake now to feed or to breed, or both, I suppose. Um, anyways, just to kind of summarize here, the, the major impacts of this dam are in-stream barriers to gene flow. Um, basically, you've created obstacles that a lot of fish can't manage, and so their populations get fragmented. Uh, and the mi migratory movement of these fishes is probably Im severely impeded because they're not going to swim up that little canal that you made for them as a fish ladder. 
um, about 80 kilometers of a beautiful river with lots of braids and waterfalls and all that, you've just turned that into a lake. All right, so you turned it into a lake, you're, now you're gonna have increased emissions, CO2 and methane. Uh, you're gonna have increased sediments coming out of that water onto the bottom. So this is a clear water river, but with all this construction going on, a lot of sediments were released into the river and it just coat, now it just coats the rocks in places where it no longer flows. And then you also have a loss of these rheophilic species. So these are species of fishes that they depend upon fast flowing water. You take that away from them and they're gone. Um, and then you have this other stretch here, the, the labyrinth part that's completely dewatered. So if you look at that, if you take more water away from that or too much water away from that, it's no longer flowing. It's no longer continuous. What it becomes is a series of isolated pools or dead ends um, and it loses the connectivity that it even had at this stage. So, you, so when you reduce, remove that connectivity, um, you, you have chances for mass fish die-offs. Fish just get trapped in an area that completely evaporates or becomes too warm and, and they die. Um, and the dewatered part is not getting that flood pulse. So that yearly flood pulse in the, in the high water season that flushes a lot of nutrients into the system. It provides a lot of new habitat for the fishes. And it's, it's really important to the, to the yearly cycle of, of these organisms. And you've, you've removed that because you need, during the low water season, you need that water to run your turbines in your power plant. And, you know, the fish are our second priority. There's also a big potential here for this. Um, so that's the flood pulse there. The yellow is the current levels. And then with the dam construction, those are where the engineers are gonna take that flood pulse. They're gonna reduce it by more than half. And then also, if you take out all the water out of these channels, now you can mine it. So, so gold mining interests have moved into this dewatered part uh, to mine for gold. Um, they were in it all along. They, they knew once you took all the water out of these channels, they'd be able to get in there and start, start looking for gold. And obviously gold mining comes with its own risks. Um, a lot of times they use cyanide, mercury, and there's always spills. And so not only have you taken away a lot of water from this stretch, but you're probably gonna pollute the hell out of it too. Um, yeah. And then the last part is uh, growth in the human population. So with the construction of this dam, a lot of people have moved into this area. Um, and the, the area itself wasn't, it, like I said, it happened overnight and it wasn't ready for this. So you had a real disruption of uh, local communities, especially the indigenous communities with the, uh, the immigration of people from not just other parts of Brazil, but from all around, from other parts of the world, just everybody descending on this uh, previously quiet town of Altamira to get in on this dam construction thing. Um, and that puts increased uh, pressure on municipalities to, to, to basically, you know, um, support these people. And with that, wow, I'm right at eight o'clock. <laughs> oh yeah, there's the last slide. So I will say thanks to everybody for, uh, um, for, for listening to that, assuming you're still awake. <laughs> well, Mark, all, all I can say is, damn. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm, I'm a, a dad. It's okay. It's, I'm allowed to say that stuff now, right? <laughs> the puns. I've heard you say worse, Mike. I've heard, I've heard you say a lot worse. <laughs> I, I plead the fifth. That was awesome, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, if we are just right about at eight o'clock, I think we have about a minute left. If, if anyone does have a, a closing question they may want to throw out at Mark, uh, we can, is that okay with you, Mark? That's fine. That's fine. I mean, I got friends on here. We could stay at, we could hang out past date if, uh, if, if they're interested. Well, let me uh, say this then. First off, uh, thank you, Mark, for a really interesting uh, presentation. It's amazing how much connects in to what seems like a, a headline, right? Like dam being built and <laughs> the implications that come out of that. 
I also want to uh, make sure we thank Fanny uh, from Drexel for helping set all this up. Uh, Fanny, thank you for, for organizing this and, and doing all the, the legwork behind it. And if people do have any questions for Mark, I, uh, you should be able to unmute yourselves now. Um, we, we can hang around for a few more minutes. And uh, if not, I hope everyone has a wonderful night. Uh, let me put my email in the chat. If you have any further questions or any curiosities, I'm happy to pass them along. Mike, I'm I'm the I'm a co-host, right? Yes, you are. All right. So if you drop out, I it still stays. Uh, we still. Yeah, stay, I, okay. I can I can host you. I can. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. We do have a great question here from from Jessica. Mm -hmm. Is there any glimmer of hope? Any glimmer of hope? Well, right now, um, because so the best. Sometimes the best things for the environment are a terrible economy. Um, so when when your when the economy is doing really poorly and, and there's no money for like big infrastructure projects like mega dams, they get put on hold. And that the the river we're look, watching right now is the next one is the river just to the west of the um, the Shingu called the Tapajos. It's another big Clearwater River. Right now, there are no major dams on the main stem, but they got plans for them. And so um, the hope is that, the hope is to save the, the, save the next river over. As far as the Shingu, those extra dams that they wanted to put in, now they got a pretty good argument for putting them in. It's like, but, Basically, they're spending. Are they spending good money after bad? So you know, you know the 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 Bello Manchi Dam is can't operate at its intended efficiency without those extra dams. So what do you do? Do you tear it down? Do you build the extra dam so it can it can operate the way it should, or do you just let it be kind of a, a message to everybody? Just don't build these dams. I don't know, that's my take on it, but there are other people on this call who um, have worked a lot more with this than I have, and maybe they have, maybe they have some better input. Uh, another question from Jeremy, has there been anyone that has surveyed the Rio, uh, I'm going to say it wrong, I'm sorry, uh, Tapajos? <laughs> I'm going to say it wrong too. Um, <laughs> Cecile, well, how do you pronounce that river? <laughs> Tapajos. Has there anybody who's been surveyed? Uh, yeah, they have. It's it's been surveyed fairly well, not as completely as the Shingu. Um, one of the reasons why the Shingu has been surveyed very well now is because of the dam building project. So it was a fairly unexplored river. As soon as they propose a dam for it, as part of the environmental impact statement, it needs to be surveyed. And so a lot of uh, Brazilian and, and part of my project, too, is basically documenting the biodiversity that occurs there um, during, before and during the construction. So it's kind of, um, it's unfortunate that it took the construction of a dam, a mega dam, to improve our understanding of one of the world's you know, most precious rivers, but that's the way it usually, that's the way it happens a lot of times. Uh, Bob is curious, uh, Bob Peck is curious, is, is your uh, project there over now or will you be going back? And I'm adding this last part, will you be wearing the Atomic Boom shirt? <laughs> oh yeah, I did bring that home. That, hold on. So I don't know if anyone picked up on some of the, the photos of Mark there, but um, you could always identify Mark in a, a field work photo by his- I was gonna wear it, but it, it hasn't been washed in a while and it kind of smells. <laughs> I'm afraid to wash it because I'm afraid there, there's so little left of it. I'm afraid it wouldn't survive another wash. Um, but anyways, going back to the Shingu. Yeah, so, I mean, Leandro, uh, he he's, a uh, professor at the university there. So I like to visit him and, and um, we have a lot of manuscripts that we need to finish up. 
uh, from, from our work there. I mean, we've, it was, the project was about five years that we were in the field and we've got so much data that, you know, we're slowly trying to, trying to publish it and um, continuing our studies. We collected a lot of specimens during our field work. And so now we have, now that we have them back in our museums, now it's kind of the, the less exciting part. We have to sit in your lab and count things and measure things to propose these new species. Um, so you try to do the responsible thing and work up the material you collected before you go out and collect a bunch more. Well, just to be respectful of everyone's time, to give everyone a free out if, if they are just being polite and, and ready to, to close out at eight. Um, thank you for joining us. If not, if you want some bonus mark time, which honestly, I'm not sure who doesn't, uh, we can definitely hang around a bit longer until Mark kicks us out, right? We're not paying, you know, we don't, we don't have any doors to close in this virtual world, which is right, really right. And if it's doing these Zoom things. And I was just astounded by the, uh, how many people joined us from all over the place. We have uh, several from Brazil, Italy, uh, Nashville, Austin, Germany, Ontario. How many, what was the total? How, what was the total attendance? Uh, I saw the, I think we had 31 people here. Cool. Awesome. Well, hey, yeah, thanks everybody. And anybody who wants to hang out, um, I'm going to get a beer and we could chat. <laughs> we could chat fishes. I think I did fix it now. So you all should be able to unmute uh, yourselves for real. Not like last time when I lied about you being able to unmute yourselves. <laughs> It's one of those Zoom power trips, I guess, you know, when <laughs> you're a co-host. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So that was probably the best because everybody would be correcting my uh, Portuguese, which is almost unintelligible. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, I actually have to go as well. But, Mark, I'm going to give you the hosting capabilities um, so people can hang along. And I will stop recording. All righty.